Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for our keynote conversation with George Will about the future of Madisonian democracy. My friends, you know how enthusiastic I am about the conversations we have here at the National Constitution Center, but there are few that I have been anticipating as eagerly as the one we are about to be privileged to hear. George Will is one of America's leading public intellectuals. He is one of the great constitutionalists among public commentators who, without fear or favor, defends constitutional values regardless of their partisan implications. And he gave the keynote speech last year on Freedom Day when we launched our Madisonian Commission for All, asking what Madison would think of our current Congress, presidency, courts, and media, and how can we resurrect Madisonian values of public reason and thoughtful deliberation today. So that's what we're going to talk to George Will about, and I just can't wait for the conversation. Please join me in welcoming the great George F. Will. Welcome back to the National Constitution Center. It is Glad such an honor to have you here. Uh, I'll just jump in. You've listened to this excellent discussion. Uh, after what you've heard, should we repeal the 17th Amendment or not? Well, uh, it, yes, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it wouldn't cure very much. Uh, it, was a, it was a bad idea to repeal it. It was, uh, it, it, as it was, it suggested that uh, the point of Republican government is small r that the people do not decide issues, they decide who shall decide the issues. And uh, I think that attaching the senators more closely to state interests would buttress federalism somewhat, but A, I am a, a, a fountain of lost causes, and I, and I know one when I see one, so this is not, go this is not going to happen. And uh, besides, if you really want to know where Federalism died. First, it hasn't died. It may be in hospice care, and it's a bit, of, it's, it's a bit anemic, but it's not dead. Uh, the Seventeenth Amendment was a kind of small tombstone over traditional federalism. What really did federalism in was the Sixteenth Amendment, because the income tax, uh, giving the federal government this enormous mechanism for siphoning up national resources. Uh, laid the, seed, the seeds of federal supremacy, the federal government supremacy in a way that, that the 17th Amendment hardly met it at all, which, of course, if we're going to blame the 16th Amendment, we're also we're back to demon rum and prohibition and all that, because one of the reasons we had to have the, 17th, the 16th Amendment was to find an alternative taxation for alcohol taxes. Uh, which uh, were terribly important to the federal government, and if we were going to ban demon rum, we had to find an alternative. The 16th Amendment was also passed because the Supreme Court in the Pollock case struck down the income tax as something that had to be apportioned among the states. Our mutual hero, William Howard Taft, originally opposed Pollock and said it was wrong because Alexander mm -hmm. Hamilton said the only taxes that had to be apportioned were head taxes. Yes. Uh, so w was the court wrong in Pollock? Should it have upheld the income tax? And might that have solved us some, some problems? I have strong feelings about so many things, but not about the Pollock case. OK. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, uh, you do have strong feelings about the progressive era. And the yes. 16th and 17th Amendment were both products of progressivism, along with instruments like the popular initiative and popular recall of judicial decisions. Tell us about why you think the progressive era represented such a threat to the Madisonian ideal. Well, it's, I think you can really understand the uh, American political thought as an argument between Madison and Woodrow Wilson, two Princetonians. I have said before and still will say that, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I will I'll, I'll speak with more vigor. Uh, uh, I'm a product of the Princeton Graduate School and I, I've often said the most important decision made in America in the 20th century, or arguably anywhere in the 20th century, was the location of the Princeton Graduate School. Because uh, Woodrow Wilson, then the president of the university, wanted it 
uh, down in the main campus. His nemesis, Dean Andrew Fleming West, wanted it where it now is, up on a hill adjacent to the campus. Uh, Woodrow Wilson had one of his characteristic snits, resigned, went into politics, and ruined the 20th century. <laughs> I, I, uh, I simplify somewhat and exaggerate a bit, but uh, the argument between the Madisonians begins with the, the Madisonians are the defenders of the natural rights doctrine of the founders. The most important word in the Declaration of Independence is the word secure. All men are created equal, endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, and governments are instituted to secure those rights, not to give us our rights. First come rights, then from government. Pre rights pre-exist government, and that conception inherently limits government. The progressives came along and said, uh, Woodrow Wilson said, frankly, don't read the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. It's Fourth of July stuff. Uh, it, it's it's uh, retrograde, and it leads to really bad things like the separation of powers, which uh, produces uh, gridlock, as one of the earlier panelists said, uh, uh, the founders didn't come to Philadelphia to devise an efficient government. The idea would have horrified them. They wanted a safe government, one strong enough to protect but not too strong to threaten our, our liberties. Uh, so to that end, they filled the government with blocking mechanisms, three branches of governments, two branches of the legislative branch, House and Senate with different electoral rhythms and constituencies, vetoes, veto overrides, supermajorities, all kinds of ways to slow the beast down. And in slowing it, not stop it, but to slow it down, to give time for opinion to moderate and let time do its work. And I've read an awful lot of stuff about Madison. The best single book on Madison by Greg Weiner of Assumption College has the wonderful title, Madison's Metronome, because his point was to get a kind of rhythm that gave a kind of decorous pace to democracy so that democracy might be somewhat safe. Defenders of the 17th Amendment say, well, we had to correct the founders' jaundiced view of democracy. And, and what they mean is the founders were constantly talking about the problems of democracy, but, and therefore, people say they were basically anti-democrats. No, the founders talked about the problems of democracy exclusively because they were exclusively interested in democracy. They were considering no other form of government. They didn't talk about the defects of monarchy uh, because that wasn't on the table. Uh, they, they were determined to have democracy work. I must endorse George's plug for Gregory Wiener's book, Madison's Metronome. As George uh, says, Wiener shows so powerfully that for Madison, the central question is slowing down deliberation because temporary and hasty majorities are ruled by passion that can dissipate. And as long as there's time enough to deliberate, then reason can prevail over time. So George, we now have to identify, you've talked about the progressive era as having undermined the cooling mechanisms that the founders put into place to slow things down. What are other important structural and technological changes in the 20th century that have undermined those cooling mechanisms and promoted passion over reason? I'll begin with the party system, which was just yeah. described. Did parties play a moderate slowing influence and has their decline led to more passion? They did because parties, which of course the founders did not anticipate and did not want. When the Constitution was ratified in 1789, 10 years later we had them. And uh, so that prescient though they were, they missed an enormous thing that was coming at them. And that you couldn't really organize a continental republic. It wasn't continental then, but what did they call their Congress? The Continental Congress. They knew where they were going. California, sooner or later. Uh, no, I, I'm fiercely opposed to almost all campaign regulations. I think all campaign finance regulations are unconstitutional because almost all money in politics is used to disseminate speech to a large country. And therefore, campaign finance laws regulating the quantity of money regulates necessarily the quantity, content, and timing of political speech. 
And all campaign finance laws, past, present, and future, have one thing in common. They're all written by incumbent legislators. And they will all be written to favor incumbency. Even if one accepts your argument that uh, McCain-Feingold harmed the parties by restricting the money that was available to them, what about the counter-argument that Citizens United made things worse by exacerbating the power of rich donors to whom the uh, candidates have to be uh, well, responsible? It, it, it didn't. Uh, it was prior campaign finance reform that drove money into PACs and out of the party system by limiting the amount you could give. All Citizens United said was, and remember, this was, arose from the question of whether or not a movie about a candidate for national office, Mrs. Clinton, could be banned in a, the, the McCain-Feingold silent period, which stipulated by the law exactly when you don't need silence, that is, right on the eve of an election. All, McCain, all Citizens United said was that people do not forfeit their rights to speak when they band together in corporate form to magnify their speaking. Most people hear the word corporation, they think, ah, well, Citizens United meant that PepsiCo and Microsoft are going to intervene in our elections. Neither has any interest in contributing large amounts of money to candidates. The corporations that were liberated are, were mostly advocacy corporations, the National Association for Abortion Rights, Sierra Club, uh, National Rifle Association, and all the rest. Those are the, all of them corporations that benefited from Citizens United, but I don't think Citizens United changed that much. All right, well then what are other sources of the polarization that Charles Cook and our other panelists mm -hmm. were describing? They, they talked about the obvious ones, self-sorting, geographic self-sorting, the virtual filter bubbles and echo chambers. What are your thoughts on those and is polarization a Madisonian problem? It's almost the Madisonian problem yeah. because Madison was about rubbing the edges off things. Uh, obviously the new media, cable television. Well, in 1980, the year before CNN was invented, 80% of all the television sets in use in the United States at the dinner hour were tuned to ABC, NBC, and CBS. I don't know what it is today, but it, that oligopoly is essentially dead. Uh, what we've got now is people living in their intellectual silos. We have a whole industry, it's called cable television, that exists to produce confirmation bias, uh, reinforcing everyone's prejudices. The good news is there are 327 million people in this country. At any given moment, about 322 million of them are not watching cable television, <laughs> not listening to talk radio. They're cleaning the gutters and fixing the screen windows and getting on with life. So it's, it's a much healthier country than you would suspect by turning on this stuff. I'm biting one of the hands that feeds me. <laughs> you're, a, you're a light uh, in a sea of unreason. Um, we'll, t we'll turn to solutions in a moment, but we have to diagnose the problem. Are there other institutional or structural changes that have contributed to this polarization? Uh, in Congress, for example, people have identified the decline of regular order, the lack of power of committee chairman. If you could get wonky, what are some other factors? Well, if you wanted to have negotiation, which is a fancy word for conversation, uh, in Congress, you could do certain things like obey the law. The law says there shall be 12 appropriation bills passed every year by October 1st. Last time that happened was almost a quarter of a century ago, 1994. If they had to do that, instead of dropping enormous, either a continuing resolution or dropping a mega bill written in private on people's desks uh, 17 hours before they vote, uh, you would have conversation and negotiation. Uh, I would also suggest that you might want to bring back earmarks. Earmarks are inefficient. Democracy is inefficient. Earmarks are a transaction cost of building coalitions in a continental society. Uh, and they grease the gears of government and uh, they don't particularly increase the size of government or government spending. Almost all government spending is now uh, 
uncontrolled entitlement programs anyway. We're arguing about a tiny portion of the budget, so there are two things I'd do. Third thing I would do, and I think the most Madisonian reform of all, is term limits. Because Madison was about incentives and try and control incentives and move behaviors this way. This gorgeous necktie you're envious of. Um, <laughs> it is lovely. It's the Federalist Society necktie. The silhouette is James Excellent. Madison. Excellent. Uh, and, and what term limits would do is, in a Madisonian way, change the incentives, A, for going into politics, and B, for making decisions while in politics. Uh, if you couldn't have a lifelong career, you would behave differently. Uh, if if uh, uh, Henry Clay came out of the Kentucky wilderness, fought his way into Washington uh, as a congressman, the day he got there, he was elected Speaker of the House, a freshman. Uh, now, of course, again, the federal government barely existed then, didn't do very much. In uh, 1789, the House and the Senate had more members than the federal bureaucracy. There was just no one there. Uh, but uh, uh, term limits would, I think, uh, again, the common phrase is people would think of the next generation, not the next election, and there's, I think, truth in that. Term limits would require a constitutional amendment, thanks yes. to the Supreme Court thanks decision. Thanks to Mr. Kennedy. No, Indeed. Not five to four. Yep. Um, would you trust uh, an Article 5 convention not to go rogue, and therefore, do you want one? <laughs> no, I would not trust an Article 5 convention. I don't, don't, I'm not big on trust. I think the whole, <laughs> well, the, the American system radiates distrust. Not of the people, that's not right, but the, of factions, to use the Madisonian term. No, I mean, the last time we tried this was the Annapolis Convention, and Madison said, well, let's go to Philadelphia and make a few tweaks of the Articles of Confederation. And of course, they got here and went rogue immediately. I'm awfully glad they did. But uh, if we're going to have an Article 5 convention, uh, I want to know who's going to play Madison and who's going to play Hamilton and who's going to play Franklin and Washington and James Wilson and all the rest. Um, it's simply a miracle that out of a population of, I, I guess, fewer than three million free Americans at that time, we got those 55 people. It's breathtaking. I mean, there aren't 55 people like that among our 327 million. <laughs> So. And this is exactly what Madison says in the Federalist Papers, opposing Jefferson's call for frequent appeals to the people. He says, let's not have another convention because we got lucky the first time and it's likely to be guided by passion. Okay, term limits, uh, uh, return to uh, regular order and also earmarks. Uh, what about the rise of direct primaries in the 70s. The presidential election system was transformed by all these populist reforms. Uh, you probably don't like those much either. Not much. Uh, in 1968, Hubert Humphrey won zero primaries and became the Democratic nominee. There was tumult in Chicago for lots of reasons, some good, some bad, and the mcgovern Fraser Commission came out, and uh, the mcgovern Fraser Commission put in place uh, reforms that gave us George McGovern, a very good, decent man who proceeded, having been produced by a popularized selection process that was going to give the will of the people, proceeded to lose 49 states. Uh, so all these systems are, are, are fallible, but uh, it, it, it does seem to me that uh, the smoke-filled room, we're not allowed to smoke anymore, so the the smoke-filled room in the Blackstone Hotel that gave us that, that, that bit of American political vocabulary. We should also remember it produced Warren Harding, which is, is, is not uh, an advertisement for that method. <laughs> but but it, it, as someone said in one of the earlier panels, the Democratic Party is now going the opposite direction to get rid of their superdelegates. All superdelegates are, are a way of institutionalizing the interest of the permanent part of our politics, which are the parties. And, and that seems to me to be a mistake. 
I, I wish all I wish that ninety five percent of the delegates were super delegates, not five percent. But other uh, reforms for strengthening the parties. Well, the most important is to give them more resources. I always talk about too much money in politics. If you think like an economist, it is astonishing how little money we invest in electoral politics. We, we invest far more money in lobbying for good reason. But when you realize that the 535 members of Congress and the president and vice president, there are only 537 people in Washington at any given time who are there because they won an election. Uh, they have so much to do with dispersing a budget of four and a half trillion dollars and we spend, they, people say, these vast sums of money. We spend about what we spend on Halloween candy every year on these elections. It, this is a rich country. It's just a wash in money. And um, what we've done with these laws is to turn this surplus into a scarcity and to drive the money out of uh, the party system into PACs and independent spending groups and uh, weakening the parties and further fragmenting the system that was supposed to give some order to the conversation. So just so I understand it, would, we ha would the Supreme Court have to further revisit Buckley v. Vallejo and deregulate uh, campaign contributions in order to make that strengthening the parties yes. possible? Yes, yes. Incumbent legislators write the limits on how much can be given to incumbent legislators who have enormous advantages and their opponents. Uh, take all the caps off. If someone wants to take $100,000 from Philip Morris, let them. Make them put it on the internet at the close of business every day. Let the journalists wallow around in this, this data and let people think about it. And could you imagine uh, Charles Koch and George Soros uh, giving to the parties rather than to individual candidates? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Sheldon Adelson uh, has all this money that he wants to uh, inject into this year's campaign. That's fine, but why not give it to the parties? Yeah. Because then you know who's responsible. Uh, we'll get to reforms in a second, but I imagine that some in our audience may be looking at us as a bunch of uh, Madisonian antiquarians. I mean, this notion that you can have a politics that's resisting populist passions, uh, embodied in uh, our mutual hero, uh, President Taft, seems mm -hmm. sort of, uh, you, you recently uh, called it a kind of uh, Taft nostalgia. Is it really realistic to imagine that uh, people could rally behind a constitutionalist president who's devoted to the Republican Party in the face of his populist rivals, Wilson and uh, Roosevelt? And like, uh, to, to, to tell the audience, because you were so, uh, it's so great that you said it, why do you think that the greatest test of a conservative is who they voted for in the election of 1912? Yeah, that's the... A, a one sentence question. If you want to determine if some sitting next to you on the airplane is a conservative, ask them who they would have voted for in 1912. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson, of course, is unthinkable. And uh, the other two, it was a year when a former president and a future president ran against the incumbent president. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had decided that Taft was, for many reasons, defective. Uh, so he went out to Assawatomie, Kansas, which produces more history than it can consume locally, uh, <laughs> and uh, gave the speech that became the basis of the new nationalism, where he said, I'm for pure democracy, pure meaning unmediated, direct as possible, hence nominating primaries, even unto having in every state the right to have referenda to recall unpopular judicial decisions. And it was that that galvanized uh, William Howard Taft. It was not easy to galvanize. He was a rather, well, if you weighed 326 pounds, you'd be hard to move also. But on, uh, only when he was president. He lost the weight on the paleo diet. He didn't. After he didn't. When he died, he weighed about what he weighed as a Yale undergraduate. Yes, indeed. Um, this is all in his book, which is... <laughs> not, not trying to plug it, but... but I'll plug it. It's, it's uh, on sale in the bookstore downstairs. And it, <laughs> no, I, I couldn't possibly... It's terrific. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, uh, your question really is, could, what if someone came along today and said, well, 
uh, we can't afford that or we shouldn't have that anyway. One of the arguments for federalism is, from a conservative point of view, is that uh, most of what government does or tries to do or wants to do, it has either no constitutional warrant for doing or no knowledge how to do it. Therefore, when the federal government acts, it more often than not makes mistakes. That's just the law of averages. And it makes continental mistakes. And whereas when state governments make their mistakes, they make them within the borders. And the odds of having four or five intelligent governors uh, at any given time is, are better than having an intelligent president at any given time. Uh, therefore, Brandeis and other, another Rosen book on Brandeis down on sale. <laughs> thank down you. We're, we're not really paying you to do this, but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, 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 Brandeis said they're the laboratories of democracy and uh, let a thousand flowers bloom and let's see what happens. So that, 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 that's why federalism is, um, uh, is such a good idea. Reforms. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just waiting here with my pen, and you have to save American democracy. Oh. So, so we have about you know 20 yeah. minutes, and let's just list the actual reforms that could resurrect Madisonian reason over passion. Mm -hmm. You are you, uh, number one. <laughs> the way to improve the caliber of argument. Yeah, and yeah. to slow things down, yeah. to slow things down. Well, first you have to explain to the American people that they used to learn this in school, novel thought. I don't think they do that anymore, but you have to, ex you have to explain to people that there's a reason for this. That, uh, that, again, when people say, oh gosh, there's gridlock, nothing gets done in Washington. Nothing gets done in Washington. Uh, uh, under the Obama administration, the, the most sweeping financial reform since the Great Depression, uh, the largest new social welfare program since 1965, Medicare and Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, lots of things get done in Washington. Probably too much gets done in Washington. But uh, uh, people have been sold the idea that that gridlock is a terrible thing. And in fact, gridlock means that people are supposed to negotiate. I do believe that the Senate rules have to go back to what they were. Uh, because now when you have, uh, we've s really amended the Constitution in practice, that we now have a supermajority requirement for everything in the Senate, and that's a terrible thing, because that does mean that one senator can stop an awful lot. And this convinces the American people that elections don't matter. And that's a very dangerous thing to, to tell uh, the, the public. So filibuster reform eliminated? Filibuster reform, absolutely. Uh, you should not be able to filibuster the motion to proceed. That is, you now can have a filibuster just by threatening to have a filibuster on proceeding to the question so you, you don't, not only don't get a debate, you don't get a debate about whether to have a debate. But it's counterintuitive because it, it, the filibuster is not a thing that slows things down? It slows things down, but it slows things down in, in a way that, that uh, doesn't produce a thoughtful majority. It, it produces a kind of minority dictate, which is different. The okay. object, uh, I mean, we are, we are a democracy. We're going to have majority rule. The Madisonian project is to make majorities temperate and reasonable, not to stop majorities from functioning. Yes, and Madison says a faction is a majority or a minority animated yes. by reason rather than passion. Yeah. Madison's revolution in democratic theory was this. Uh, before Madison, those few political philosophers who thought that democracy was possible, thought that it was possible and advisable only in something like Pericles Athens or Rousseau's Geneva, that is a small face-to-face -face society you could walk across in a day. Because, they said, in large polities you would have factions and factions were the enemy of good government. Madison turned this upside down. He had a simple catechism. He said, to, what is the worst outcome of politics? Tyranny. To what form of tyranny are democracies prey? Tyranny of the majority. Solution, don't have majorities. Don't have stable, 
tyrannical majorities, have majorities composed of shifting, unstable coalitions of minorities. And therefore, you can have majority rule can be safe because majorities are not going to be permanent and dangerous. So to that end, that was his way of reconciling popular government with the fear of tyranny. Beautifully explained. So crystalline in its clarity. And yet today, and yet Madison counted on the extended size of the republic to prevent uh, minorities yes. from factional, from mobilizing. And he thought it'd be hard for these mobs to <coughs> discover each yes. other and to become permanent. And yet today, we have a social media technology mm -hmm. that has allowed the kind of instant communication and mob mobilization that Madison feared. Yes, in Federalist 10, he said, an extensive republic will give us what Martin Diamond, a great student of the founders, called a saving multiplicity of factions to produce these unstable coalitions of majorities. So that, said he in Federalist 51, we will see throughout our system the process of supplying by opposite and rival interests the defect of better motives. He wanted a system that would work even if people didn't have most of the time good motives. And one of the problems today is that people do not uh, Madison said in 51, you must ass the interest of the man must be identified and aligned with the interest of the place. That is, senators should be jealous and rivalrous, and House members should be jealous and rivalrous. The problem today is that members of the Senate aren't caring about the Senate. They're caring about their tribe, their party. Uh, what we need are people who think first as senators and, late, and only then as Democrats and Republicans, it seems to me. Because a lot of people have now discovered the conservative anxiety about the presidency. For years, uh, conservatives preached congressional supremacy. Then they had the intoxicating experience of President Reagan and they decided that the presidency just fine, and they put back on the shelf what they should get down and reread James Burnham's book, Congress and the American Tradition, about the importance of Congress as the primary branch of government. So Congress has been giving away power, just throwing it away, giving it to the executive branch, uh, and therefore, as, every time it does this, I mean, this president's no worse than others in this regard. He says, well, I'm going to impose tariffs on China. Where do you get that power? The power to regulate the commerce with nations is a congressional power that they just gave away in vast chunks of discretion to the executive branch because they no longer are rivalrous and greedy about keeping their power. How do you get them to be rivalrous and greedy again? That's a good question, because uh, here we're in another election year. Men and women are going to spend gobs of money and calories of energy getting to the Senate. And I want to ask them why. Because you know, Ben Sass of Nebraska, uh, in his maiden speech in the Senate, said, if the Senate didn't exist, would we notice? Would it really matter? because the people are fighting to get into an increasingly hollow institution. Uh, so if you had more congressional supremacy, you'd have a, a, a less swollen presidency, and people would have to argue about things about tariffs and going to war, things like that. Should the Supreme Court strike down rule by executive order is unconstitutional? I think that they should re reinvigorate the delegation, the non-delegation doctrine. That there, sh John Locke said in the Second Treatise on Government, legislatures may make laws; they may not make other legislatures and other legislators. We have essentially given the fourth branch of government now, the administrative state, the power to. Uh, pass, the, do the real lawmaking. Uh, Chris DeMuth, a very wise Washingtonian, says Congress now, nowadays passes velities. Congress says, well, we should have uh, a good environment and a, a fine education, and then turns it over to the executive branch, tell us what we meant by that. And the executive branch writes all the rules. We're beginning to see 
a, a pushback on something called Chevron deference, which comes from a, a case with the word Chevron in it, <clears throat> wherein the court said any reasonable executive construction of an ambiguous federal statute should be deferred to. Uh, I'm among those, a small but growing tribe, who thinks that we've had far too much judicial deference to the elected branches of government. Uh, and Neil Gorsuch, in a recent Supreme Court opinion in which he joined four liberals, uh, said, no, we've, we've, these ambiguous laws are not laws properly, and uh, the court should, should uh, uh, make the, uh, should not be afraid to say that, uh, uh, what they mean. Justice Gorsuch is one of the leading critics of Chevron deference, and you've long called for a resurrection of the non-delegation doctrine. But the fear of progressives and also conservative advocates of judicial restraint is this would have judges striking down the whole post-New Deal administrative state and would resurrect the kind of rule by judiciary that both sides, at least at some point in the 20th century, feared. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I, you said, who do you trust? I don't trust anyone, and I don't, I don't think we have a system based on trust. But at this point, and for the foreseeable future, I'm less afraid of judges wielding their power than I am of judges stepping out of the way for other branches of government wielding their power. Let me ask you this. Uh, applaud if you would like, ladies and gentlemen. We have had a friendly debate about this, and I had defended the bipartisan tradition of judicial deference represented by Holmes and Brandeis and Frankfurter, and you've called for judicial engagement. Have, have you changed your mind on this yes. as well? Yes, absolutely. T tell us about why well, and how. Well, B Robert Bork, who's the very embodiment of what I now oppose, was a very good friend. And I fought so strenuously in my column in the Washington Post and elsewhere for his confirmation that the day the Senate voted on it, my friend Meg Greenfield, who ran the editorial page of the Washington Post, had a big editorial called Dear George trying to talk me in off the ledge. Uh, <laughs> not, not successfully. Bob was a majoritarian. Yeah. And he believed in the phrase from his friend and colleague at the Yale Law School, Alex Bickle, uh, in the counter-majoritarian dilemma. That the, I don't happen to believe there is a counter-majoritarian dilemma. The, Counter-majoritarian dilemma allegedly is this. We are a democracy, therefore majority should rule. Therefore, judicial review is inherently problematic because it says what majorities can't do. Well, the whole Constitution is a tapestry of things you can't do. It's a, if you want an established church, sorry, can't have it. I want restrictions on freedom of the press. Nope, sorry, rule that out, can't do it. Um, so um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, my least favorite justice of all time, said, if the people want to go to hell, I will help them. It's my job. <laughs> I do not think it is his job to do that. I think it's his job to try and stop them. Again, slow them down. If the court says something, does something wrong, um, they can be corrected. They are appointed by politically elected presidents. They are confirmed by elected senators. Democracy is still involved in this, but again, it should be delayed and deflected and mediated and filtered, all those Madisonian verbs. Is judicial engagement all the more necessary as a cooling mechanism now that the other ones are gone? Absolutely. Uh, particularly at now that uh, factions are so adept using the new media and other things to make their way felt. Judicial Engagement is, is the title of a book by Clark Neely, who's now at Cato Institute, was formerly at the Institute for Justice. The Institute for Justice in Washington specializes in finding things that majoritarian institutions, usually state legislatures do, responding not to majorities, but to determined factions. Uh, in the state of Louisiana, the uh, florists 
got together and said we have to stomp out competition from amateur flower arrangers. So they got the, the, some flower board appointed by the state legislature. No majority ever wanted that, no more. A majority of Louisianans don't know it exists, but it said if you're going to arrange flowers, you have to go to flower arranging school and pay this and pay that and spend all these hours. And uh, in what sense is it a counter-majoritarian dilemma for a court to step in and say, no, that is interfering with the rights of the natural rights of amateur flower arrangers who want to earn a living doing this without going to school and paying an, an admissions fee into this profession. This happens all across the country. There are about 25% uh, of the jobs in the United States are now subject to occupational licensing, all of which are written, again, by legislatures, not in response to a majoritarian demand, but in response to the, to the rent seeking on the part of factions trying to restrict entry into their field for their own competitive advantage. The case against judicial engagement would be this. If Justice Kennedy retires, and there's a solid conservative majority, then the Supreme Court could strike down by five to four, six to three votes, affirmative action, environmental regulations, clean water regulations, financial regulations, the Affordable Care Act, the Voting Rights Act, and it would look to half of the country, this polarized country, like a bunch of partisans in robes imposing their political preferences. So what do we do about that? They, they, have to, they would have to be judicious. And see, what makes the Supreme Court so interesting is they have to say why they did what they did. They have to make an argument and the dissenters make an argument, and the concurrences make arguments. It's a uniquely educational institution. It used to be said by Daniel Borston and others uh, back in the 1950s when there was a consensus theory of American history that our history is defined mostly by consensus. And Daniel Borston, great historian, librarian of Congress, said we don't do political philosophy in America. Actually, we do it all the time. It's done by the Supreme Court. They argue about rights. The Supreme Court has said that citizenship is the right to have rights. Um, so it, it, the Supreme Court would have to defend itself. Now, take the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts bending over backwards to not uh, trample on the majoritarian decision of the Congress said, okay, the individual mandate can survive. That is, the Congress passed a law saying you have to engage in commerce. You have to buy health insurance because it's really a tax. The president said it wasn't a tax. Congress said it wasn't a tax. To, to impose this saving construction, as he called it, the Chief Justice said, we'll call it a tax and therefore uh, Congress, it's not unconstitutional. Okay, but a couple months ago, Congress repealed the individual mandate. So the democratic system still can make itself felt, but the court set the terms of that debate. I, we can't, we've well mooted the presidency, Congress, and the courts. We need to take a beat before we close on the media. Does Facebook and Twitter uh, pose a threat to Madisonian democracy? Yes, because they're instantaneous. Uh, that's one of the reasons why so much of what is said in Twitter and Facebook is so shrill, uh, is that people don't think. They don't have to. They can just hit send and it goes off into the ether. Now, I, I've never tweeted. Well, I, I think someone tweets for me. <laughs> for, no, from my column twice a week. I'm told I have a Facebook page. I've never seen it. Quite literally, I, I, I'm just not interested. There's not enough time in the day. You can either read or you can do this stuff, and I'd rather read. But, uh, and I, I, you know, I have a feeling that the novelty is going to wear off. Uh, how, many, how many hours can you spend on Facebook before you think, I've already done this? There, there are a lot of cat videos out there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
The, isn't it, it's a nonpartisan statement to say that the idea of tweeting presidents would have appalled Madison. Yes, and you know who was the first tweeting president? Barack Obama. I for, I've forgotten, he's, he, his first tweet was, hello, it's Barack, really, two exclamation marks. Really, exclamation marks, I mean, right there. I mean, before, before the 45th president did this, he got an idea from the 44th president. That's a, that's a good and they all get these, I mean, if you look at the text of uh, Roosevelt's first fireside chat, taking advantage of this marvelous thing, radio, that brought a politician into your living room, he began it with words that are not in the text it, up at the library. He began it, my friends. Hmm. I don't want presidents to be my friends. They're the head of one of our three branches of our federal government. I want them to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Why does he have to be my friend? I don't want this kind of intimacy. But he went I'm, on I'm to serious. Uh, it, it's not healthy for people to think that presidents are our moral auditors, our spiritual advisors, our consolers in time of grief. They're to see that the laws are faithfully executed. Get on with it. He went on to say, I can't resist. I want to talk to you tonight about banking. And then yes. he went on for a long, wonky right. address, and people at least had to sit for a half hour to right. hear the details. Right. But with tweets, they're instantaneous. So what do you do to slow down debate, given tweets? <laughs> well, again, conservatives were taught by Bill Buckley to stand athwart history shouting stop. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, this stuff is here to stay. But I do think it gets boring after a while and people will get used to it. I think 10 years from now, Facebook will be a shadow of itself. Uh, we'll go on to some other mistake. Uh, <laughs> that's the story of the human race. But uh, it just might be possible for someone to run for office saying, you know, it is not dignified for presidents to behave this way. Now, I know that dignity is far down the list of what we're looking for in, in presidents, but there will, come, there will be a correction. There will be, that people will say, you know, we, we tend to, uh, as, I, as I've said, uh, uh, Mr. Trump is occasioning Taft nostalgia. Don Rumsfeld has a new book coming out today uh, saying Gerald Ford was, by the way, a pretty good president and uh, for some of the reasons that got him criticized then, which was he, he didn't pretend to be a moral savant. Uh, he just wanted to see that the laws were faithfully executed. Uh, I think the 45th president is going to cure us of presidential fastidiousness. You know, we go into these elections, oh, Kasich's wrong on this, and oh, Jeb Bush, no, not unsound on that, or uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. My view is, now bring them all on. You know, anything's an improvement. <laughs> I'm so loath to close, as Lincoln said as in the Lincoln second inaugural. Yes. I'm loath to close. That we, was the first we inaugural. We part as friends, yeah. First inaugural. First inaugural, yeah. thank you. But I must ask you this crucially important question. We've had this great discussion tonight about how all of the cooling mechanisms that Madison put in place are under siege and his hope of promoting reason rather than passion is so imperiled. Will the Constitution save us or not? Well, the, no, the Constitution won't. The Constitution will give us a chance to save ourselves. That is, the Constitution still makes things difficult, and it still requires us to go through certain hoops. And it's still, people say, when they read the Bill of Rights, if ever they do, they realize that it is a series of proscriptions, things they can't do. So the Constitution that people say they respect is about among other things, restrictions on the popular will. I grew up in central Illinois, Champaign County. Uh, the Champaign County's uh, red uh, sandstone courthouse is where, local lore has it, and as we say in journalism, it's a story too good to check. Uh, 
where it is said, Lincoln, a very prosperous railroad lawyer at that time, probably in the 1%, uh, heard about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Kansas-Nebraska Act was uh, one of the worst things ever done. Uh, Stephen A. Douglas of the state of Illinois did it, and it said, all right, let's just vote slavery up or down. Popular sovereignty in the territory. And Lincoln, who'd been out of politics, said no. The greatest career in the history of world government, Lincoln's career, began with a recoil against popular sovereignty on matters that should not be submitted to a vote. Uh, Lincoln said, uh, we, we, we don't vote on this. Uh, slavery where it exists, can't do anything about that, got the problem, but expansion of slavery will not vote on. So the greatest career, I think in world government, certainly in American history, began with a recoil against popular sovereignty. Well, I can't, I gotta ask one last question. Will we, in fact, in this polarized 24-7, Twitter time, find leaders who will recoil against popular sovereignty and resist popular sovereignty. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I, looking on the bright side is I am disinclined to do. <laughs> uh, uh, again, I, it, Robert Nisbet, a great sociologist and conservative, said the great, greatest, most explosive force in modern life is boredom. And I think even boorishness can be boring. I think Twitter can be born. I think it's all going to, people are going to say, wake up someone and say, I've done that, tried that, let's do something else. And I just harbor this uh, um, suspicion that some candidate is going to come along, and more than one, and say, uh, if that's what you want, that's not what I do. Uh, but if you want something else, here it is. And I think they're going to find there's a market out there. Markets work, and there's going to be a demand, and when there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. On that optimistic note, please join me in thanking the great George Will. <laughs> <laughs>